Welcome back to the Diet Doctor podcast with Dr. Brett Schur. Today I'm joined by Dr. Spencer Nadolski. Dr. Nadolski is board certified in family medicine and obesity medicine, but as you'll hear, also has a great deal of uh, experience and interest in lifestyle medicine. He's, he was a division one wrestler. He has, has spent a lot of time learning about exercise physiology and wanting to take that knowledge and help people improve their life and their health with lifestyle. And he got a little flack for this, it sounds like, in his medical training, which is really interesting, and we'll get into that. But he also has specific interests in weight loss and in lipidology. And he's not the typical low-carb person. In fact, he's frequently thought of as anti-low-carb. But as you'll hear in our discussion today, he really has an open mind. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted him on the show, because it's good to get different perspectives. He's going to give you a different perspective on lipids than you hear in the low-carb community. He's going to give you a different perspective about calories and insulin and the carbohydrate model than you usually get uh, in the low carb circles, but he also has an open mind and he realizes there's a place for different treatments and different tools. And that's one of the things I hope you appreciate about him. You may not agree with everything he says, but I hope you appreciate his approach. And more importantly, he's interested in learning more and he wants to help foster more studies so we can learn about LDL and hyper responders. And is it a problem or is it not? Because we can talk hypothetically all we want. What we need is the data, and Dr. Nadolsky is someone who's trying to be on that front line to help us get there. So I hope you enjoy this exploration of some different ideas, uh, and I hope you enjoy Dr. Nadolsky's open mind and his approach. So sit back and enjoy this interview, and if you want to learn more, you can go to dietdoctor.com. You can see the full transcripts and, of course, access all, all the different information we have on dietdoctor.com. Dr. Spencer Nadowski, welcome to the Diet Doctor podcast. Thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. It's good to be local. Yeah, it's not great that you're local and able to stop by for an interview today. This is a true pleasure. Now, you you have a really interesting background that I, that I want to get into, and um, so people can learn about you and what brought you to this point of your career. So tell us a little bit about after medical school, what happened to you? Where'd you go? What'd you do? Tell us about your training. Yep. So I, it's, I want to back up to before medical oh. school because the exercise science and nutrition science are what got me really good at athletics. My dad was a wrestling coach, football coach, brother is a really good wrestler as well in college. We used science to get good at athletics. And so my thing was, I didn't feel much fulfillment out of helping people get better at performance. I really wanted to use that science for the betterment of the general population to reverse or prevent, cure, if you want to say, uh, chronic disease. So I went to medical school with that thinking. I wasn't sure if I was going to do endocrinology or some sort of preventive medicine or family medicine, internal medicine. Uh, but eventually, uh, after medical school, decided on family medicine. And I went and did training at, uh, at VCU over in, in Virginia uh, with a real focus on nutrition and exercise and, and lifestyle medicine with a good combination of, of pharmacology and, and everything like that to combine it, but to really hone in on, on helping prevent cure uh, chronic disease. Yeah, so actually you're right. We should start well before medical school <laughs> and even before college because you were sort of a champion wrestler and yeah. football player and not just your average athlete. I mean, you were sort of like state champion or something, yep, right? Yep, yeah, yeah. And, and the story behind that, I, I actually, my brother was really good all throughout high school. I came in and I actually didn't start, and I was, I was taller. He was like five foot nothing at the time when he was a freshman. He's now like five five. I was like five ten, ended up six foot two. I had to really grow into my body, whereas he was a little bit stockier. He was like a four-time state finalist, two-time state champ. Wow. I didn't even start my freshman year. So I had to really look into nutrition and exercise science to build muscle, uh, improve my performance to get good. So then once I became a state champ, uh, really thought, this is cool, but again, wanted to use that information just to give a fraction of it to the general population because that's how you really prevent and cure chronic disease. Yeah, so so great. So you came into medical school thinking yes. prevention, thinking Correct. I'm going to help people with lifestyle, yep. which is really kind of the opposite of what most people come in with. And I think if a lot of people come in with that, they're probably it's probably beat out of them during the course of their training because you don't get a lot of it. And it, it's you're inundated with pharmacology, you're yep. inundated with these rare diseases, 
and we don't talk enough about exercise and nutrition. So did you find it hard? Like you were, it was lacking as you were going through the schooling? Yeah. The, medical school, I mean, everybody jokes about doctors don't learn much about nutrition in medical school. It's, it's actually true. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, you know, when you go through medical school, you'll see in the guidelines, yes, it's number one, lifestyle is number one. But anyway, let's learn about the drugs. Right. So, and it wasn't so much medical school, but it was during residency. There was actually a time when one of my advisors said they thought that I was a little bit overzealous about nutrition with my patients. Really? And and my response was, this is as an intern, yeah. I, and I said, you know what, I'm not overzealous. I said, you're underzealous. Wow, you and said that as yes, an intern. And, and, and eventually, you know, it's kind of funny, but I became the intern of the year, yeah. and by the end of graduating medical school, they said, you know what, uh, I'm really sorry, you were right, I was wrong. And actually became a champion for uh, pushing lifestyle as medicine. Yeah. And I think, you know, it is. It's really important. It's, it's, it's starting to become more common now in medical school. You start seeing some of these programs out there. I know we can get into the nuance of what types of nutrition they're pushing. Right. Uh, right. But at least it's becoming more uh, mainstream right. uh, now. So when we talk about lifestyle, I mean, there's a whole bunch of different pillars of lifestyle with the main two, though, being nutrition and exercise. Right. So so let's start with exercise. You're the doc who lifts, yeah, yeah. right? That's your, your nickname, the doc who lifts. So, so much of what we hear lately is that you can't unre- outrun a bad diet. Right. Exercise is not the path to weight loss. Um, nutrition first, and it's not about, you know, exercising more. So exercise has really sort of been knocked down in right. terms of its place and lifestyle in some circles. Now, personally, I have a problem with that because I think it's important, and I'm sure you yeah. do as well. So give us your thoughts about that. I mean, is it true you can't outrun a bad diet. What is the place of exercise in health and weight loss in your mind? Yeah, there's still a very strong place in the exercise physiologist. When you go to the, uh, these obesity conferences, I go to the obesity week uh, every year has the obesity society and then the surgeons and everybody in between these researchers. And so the exercise physiologists kind of push back. They're like, wait a second. No, exercise does have its place. Yeah. The problem is if you don't take into account the nutrition, it's really hard to outrun or out-exercise a bad diet because of the compensatory mechanisms of our appetite and everything like that. But if you have a little bit of you know nutrition uh, going for you, the exercise can very much optimize your body composition and weight loss efforts. Most importantly, though, the, the energy gap after you lose weight using nutrition uh, really bringing your physical activity up. We're starting to see a lot of data to, to show that those who keep the weight off are the ones that are most physically active because of that energy gap difference. Interesting, yeah. And and when we talk about exercise, there are really, I guess, three different kinds that people talk about now. And there's the high-intensity interval training, there's the resistance training, and there's the slow, steady distance or sort of the zone two training. Now, do you have a favorite for weight loss? Do you have a favorite for metabolic health? Do you have a favorite for general health? Or what's your general approach with so, those? So, you know, we have the weightlifting zealots. I'm a little bit of a meathead myself. So, yeah. of course, I love lifting weights. But I would be, I would be wrong to say that's, that's the only way to do it. Uh, ideally, and you're a cardiologist, so you'd appreciate this. I think, you know, the synergy between like a angiotensin receptor uh, blocker or ACE inhibitor and then like a thiazide together, I think of like aerobic training and resistance training as like a good combination medicine. So ideally, a combination of all of it. Uh, You're not going to be able to uh, recover every day if you're doing high intensity interval training and lifting. So ideally, you'd have some steady state in there to help with recovery. Uh, and it can be a, it can be very good for endothelial function and everything like that, and then just being able to co- recover while while burning more calories as well, just from a weight loss standpoint. Yeah. So it's a good analogy. The two drugs. Yeah. Uh, so the two drugs you, you were talking about, they work better together than they do individually. Yeah. So that's your that's a good analogy with the exercise that yeah. they work better together. Now some people though they haven't exercised at all, right? They've been overweight their whole life. They've been fairly sedentary. And just the thought of high intensity interval training is like, oh my God, how do I even get started? Or the thought of resistance training, like what do I even do? So how do you help people sort of get over that initial hurdle to get started um, to help them help themselves? I actually went to the gym with my patients uh, and that seemed to have helped them overcome that that thought of, of fear. 
Uh, it's like nobody really cares. They're at the gym. You just got to get in and, and get out. So people are scared of weights. You know, they, they're scared. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know if they're going to have good form. They're, they think people are going to make fun of them. Yeah. Uh, and so actually going with them helped a lot. And that's why I actually think having a, a gym clinic would be ideal. So say if you have your preventive cardiology clinic, you know, you could have your cardiac rehab, but actually having a gym yeah. with that clinic, I think would be perfect, but yeah. it is tough to get over. That's fantastic that you're able to go to the gym with your patients. I yeah. mean, I remember when I was doing my preventive cardiology fellowship, I would have my office visits walking the track. Yeah, and, and that's I mean, great. I love that. It's such a better way to interact with the patients and that sort is. of help them. But mm-hmm. in the gym, even more important, because, but you know form, you know weightlifting, you know how to do that. Most doctors don't, let's right, be right. honest, right? Most doctors have no clue where to get started. Um, so I think the key is working with a professional, right. finding somebody who yeah. can really help. And it doesn't you get have started. to be the diet. You can get a, a good strength coach or whatever to work with, but just understanding that resistance training, any type of activity is going to help the patient. Yeah. All right. And then, you know, one of the worst things that can happen though, is someone starts and gets injured right. and says, this is not for me. I'm never yeah, going to try it again. Done. They feel like it's punishment, whatever. Yeah. Right. You want to get them, you want to get them in and not feeling too bad at yeah. the beginning. And what about people who just like, hate exercise, right. right? There are some people out there who just hate it. They just don't like the way it feels. They've never done it yeah. before. How do you help them sort of psychologically to get over that hurdle to start exercising and convince them this is a big part of their health? Somehow finding any physical activity that, that they enjoy, whether it's hiking, you know, ideally I'd get everybody in working out, doing, doing squats, bench press, whatever, deadlift. Yeah. Uh, but not everybody's going to do that. I'm not, you know, silly to think that everybody can do that. So any type of physical activity, you know, if it's dancing, whatever somehow getting out there going on getting a bike going for walks uh anything will do yeah it's an interesting sort of hierarchy just more physical activity right then sort of the zone two aerobic cardiovascular exercise then the resistance training then the high intensity interval training like taking them stepwise through in a safe manner and sort of educating them about how each one impacts their health i think that's important yeah Yeah. now you've mentioned a couple times with exercise the calorie balance yeah maintaining the calorie deficit. So again, there are two schools of thought. There's the calorie in, calorie out model. There's the carbohydrate insulin model. Right, so right. so calorie in, calorie out, it's all about energy balance. All you have to do is expend more calories than you take in. Whereas the carbohydrate insulin model says not so fast. It has more to do with the type of calories. Right, right. You know, paints it as a black and white picture. What's your take on that sort of general? So concept? yeah, I, I actually, through medical school, worked with... The, Big time uh, low carb doctors now, you know, Dr. Finney, Dr. Westman, um, yeah, two and, of the best, and many, many more. So as I kind of came through that lens, I then became a little bit skeptical because I started having patients who would come in saying, "I ate a basically a, a low fat, high carbohydrate diet and lost a hundred pounds," and I was like, "Gosh, that." doesn't seem to make sense according to, you know, basically what I learned. And the whole insulin carbohydrate hypothesis made sense because in medical school we learn how insulin's anabolic. As if it's high, you're building fat. But then as I started getting into more of the pathophysiology and, and how, you know, you, you actually become insulin resistant and lipolytic because the insulin's not even working, et cetera, et cetera. And then having some of these patients that were losing weight on a high carbohydrate, low fat, you know, vegan type of diet, it was like, okay, maybe there's more to it. Getting more in, uh, into the science, I, I became good friends with Kevin Hall. Yeah, I, you probably know who he is. Of course. And a lot of these other scientists. And so the way I view it is that the hormonal hypothesis, is, those are very important because those can tell you where you store, store your energy. And also not only that, but maybe changes in appetite and, and inflammation and things like that. So it's very important, and it goes along with uh, the, the calories in, calories out, energy balance uh, uh, hypothesis. So yeah. I kind of view them as together that you can't separate them completely because obviously if you give somebody 100% fruit juice, yeah, I'm sure, if they drink 800 calories of apple juice a day, they're going to lose weight. But how are they going to be able to maintain that? They're going to feel miserable type of thing. Right. So that's where my stance is right yeah, now. Yeah, I think those are, you brought up a lot of topics we need to unpack yeah. there. So it's really interesting. So one is the short term versus the long term. Right. Right. And, you know, anybody can lose weight on a calorie deficit, right. um, high carbohydrate diet for the short term. And the mm-hmm. questions are, what does it do to your metabolism and what does right. it do for, for long term weight loss? And I don't know that we have great data to, to support that. Um, you know, when you compare low carb versus low fat diets for weight loss, um, 
the low carb diets uniformly work better at six months, at 12 months. Right. And then after that, in a lot of the studies, the curves kind of converge yeah. and compliance goes down. And it right. makes it really hard to know scientifically what the right answer is. Right. Yeah. I think a lot of it also is with our current environment, I, my personal bias is that it would be easier to stick with a low carbohydrate diet. Because if, if somebody's saying eat whole grains, you know, I have a box of cookie crisp that I just bought because of like for dessert purposes. Like if I needed a little a little sugar fix once in a while, a cookie crisp, but it's a children's cereal. It says whole grains is like right. their number one ingredient, 10 grams of whole grains per uh, per serving. And it's like, look, I, I wouldn't give my daughter this cookie crisp for cereal uh, breakfast every single day. Why would, you know, it would be easier just to say, Hey, go to a low carb diet. You, then you completely get that out of your out of your vision anyway. Yeah. So that's why I do think a low carbohydrate diet in this current environment is easier to stick to. That's what I think. Yeah, and in controlling cravings. So you know, right. there are there. I would agree with you completely. There are some people who can do well on a low fat, higher carbohydrate diet, and they're not the people who have addictive personalities and cravings, and and they're not. Um, and for somehow they are able to control their hunger. That's not everybody. There is right. a large population out there who need to control the cravings. So do you find on the, the low-carb diet that cravings are better controlled? Yeah, so so this is what I get into you know, on the Twitter things. Like When I say car high carbohydrate to patients, they're not going out and getting like legumes in, in their f like lentils in their like form, you know, yeah. whole form. They're going out and getting french fries and, and potatoes and cereals, pastas, breads. And it's, it's just hard to control those. I mean, I, you know, I don't need to control my caloric intake, but like if I were trying to cut back on some of those things, it would be tough right. to do. So I do find that, you know, just completely cutting those things out and going to a low carb, you know, at the most your, your carbohydrate may be some more fibrous fruit at the highest, but vegetables, it just completely cuts out their cravings and yeah. things like that. Yeah. And then the next concept is that of insulin resistance. And, right. and talking about insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia, they frequently get combined together, but right. sometimes they're two different things. So I yep. think that's really interesting because those people who do eat a higher carbohydrate vegan diet um, can be having trouble still with hyperinsulinemia. Whereas with the low carb diet, you mentioned there's some insulin resistance there. But I think we need to sort of differentiate the insulin resistance with hyperinsulinemia, sort of the generalized insulin resistance, versus the more localized insulin resistance at like the muscle level with right, right. still lower insulin levels. So are, do you differentiate between those in your patients and kind of look for that? Yeah. So anybody that has any signs of hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance, regardless, I'm trying to help them lose weight in, in, in any way possible. So yeah. like looking at the hype, you know, the pathophysiology of having uh, the ectopic fat in your pancreas and all over the place, right? any type of weight loss. But again, I tend to find that, you know, most of the time they're just eating too many calories from things like croissants, donuts, which are high in carbs and fat. Mm -hmm. So going to a lower carb diet tends to cut those things out anyway. They, they're usually not replacing those things with like lentils, as I said. So right. I, I tend to try to go for weight loss in general. And I do use weight loss drugs if needed, if I, if I think that they're just, they've tried multiple times in the past. Uh, so I have my obesity certification, and everything like that. So I do use, you know, things like GLP-1 agonists. If they've tried multiple times, they just for some reason, their appetite and, and cravings, even on like ketogenic type of diets, uh, I do use those. But um, in general, yeah, I, I, I try to get them to cut calories, but they tend to be more of those hyper palatable, high carbohydrate type of foods. Yeah, so let's talk about a specifically a ketogenic diet, right? There's low carb and there's ketogenic. Yeah. So, you know, in people who need weight loss, who are struggling with it, and before you go to a weight loss drug, will you try a ketogenic diet or does it sort of depend on the yeah, circumstances? Yeah, I try. Pretty much I get a good diet history on them. Most of the times they've tried, you know, Atkins in the past. Mm -hmm. Maybe it wasn't very well developed or anything like formulated. Uh, some Most of people have tried Weight Watchers in the past, counting calories. Once they've come to me, a weight loss doctor, they've tried multiple things. Yeah. So, yeah, I do tell them like a, a well-formulated ketogenic diet can be therapeutic in appetite regulations similarly to these drugs that we use. So if they're willing to do that, we definitely do that. Sometimes people just, you know, they're just not willing to do it. Yeah. Uh, and that's why I actually like the Verta studies because 
if you can monitor them with the ketones, you can see that they're adhering. But a lot of times patients are just like, I'm not going to do that. I can promise you that. Right. It's like, overcoming okay. that initial hurdle yeah. that so many people have. I need my carbs. Right. I need, or like fat is bad. And, you know, the things we've been taught for so long that aren't necessarily true or aren't right, true right. at all, right? To have to like counteract that. Yep. And you even brought up the, the point about whole grains, right? This yeah. concept of healthy whole grains. It's like right. it's one word. Right. It's not just whole grains. Yeah. It's healthy whole right. grains. It's one and cookie word. crisp. The cookie yeah. crisp cereals. Healthy right. whole grains. That's healthy whole grains, right? And that's the society we're in. And that's why that's why it's so important to, to be able to somehow break down these barriers right. that people have or these concepts that people have. But the message can get confusing, right? Yes. I mean, because on the one hand, keto may not work for everybody, right? right. And and um, lower fat, high carb is not going to work for everybody. Right. But people want this sort of black and white, just tell me what the diet is to follow that's going to work for me, where it's not always so, so clear cut. Um, and there's not even necessarily a progression. I guess that's what I'm trying to get at. Do you have a progression where you try keto first and then try a, a low carb? Or, But I guess there really isn't a progression. It's hard. To... I, I try to individualize for each person. I do think, you know, so I, I, I know some good fitness companies that do only calorie counting. They call it like the if it fits your macros. Basically, they Tetris together their foods and put it all in their MyFitnessPal or Lose It app. Yeah. And some of them can have in short term, you know, seems like one to three years they can do really well, but it's kind of an external device. They're using an external device, maybe not hunger cues, to then follow their caloric deficit. Yeah. And there's a selection, but there ends up being a selection and survivorship type of bias because these companies are known for doing well with this particular method. And so when they see people doing well, they hear what's their method, and, and then they hear that and they go, well, I could probably do that. And so then they keep getting more success in that one method and then the same thing when you see the whole foods plant-based type of people they're all yelling at each other on but no this is how i lost 100 pounds it's like right. that's how you lost 100 pounds then you got a carnivore person who's who's you know lost massive amounts of weights and they're like but obviously i can do this and the the you know and the, the the vegans are saying that's not possible that's not good for you but it's like that person lost 100 200 pounds or whatever it was i think that's pretty good for them and if they can stick to that, uh, more power to them. Yeah. That's, that's kind of my uh, the way I am now. Yeah, it's a good approach to, to realize that there are a lot of different ways out there, but also that weight loss isn't the only metric, right? right and I right. think that's so important. Yep. It's weight loss. It's how do you feel. Yes. Um, it's insulin levels. Quality of life and, is very yeah, important. Right, quality of life and and all your metabolic metrics, and then, of course, also your lipid metrics, right? right? Yes. Which is a big deal, and I know yes. you have a, a personal interest in lipidology, yes. as do I. Um so lipids are a fascinating topic because for so long it's been whatever lowers your LDL is good. Right. Right. And that's what we've been taught. Now you started, sounds like, as a skeptic yes. to the LDL hypothesis and then sort of switched to become mm -hmm. more of a believer in the right. LDL hypothesis. Yep. Yeah. So tell us about that progression for you. So, you know, kind of going through medical school with that low carb lens, there tend, tended to be a lot more of the LDL skeptics in uh, that arena. And so, you know, reading the same kind of cholesterol con type of books, and, and they, they brought up a lot of good points. And back then, uh, it was, I believe, it was the enhanced trial with Zedia mm -hmm. and uh, Simvastatin. And, and one of the things that stuck out in my mind was like, look, they lowered the LDL further, but the CIMT wasn't any different. And they didn't have the hard outcomes yet. Right. And it was like so. That was a study just to bring everybody up. It was a randomized trial where half the half the group got um, sorry, they all got CIMTs, carotid intima media thickness test. Half the group got simvastatin. Half the group got simvastatin plus Zetia, a medication that lowers cholesterol even further. And so they did. They had lower LDLs, but in the end, there was no difference in plaque progression right. in their C or or a change in their CIMT. So the conclusion was. It's not all about the LDL because yep. we lowered it further and it had no further effect. Yep. yep. And there and there are multiple other things. But for some reason, that one stuck out. And so it was like, yeah, maybe statins, yeah, sure, maybe they lower LDL. But maybe there was something about them, you know, the pleiotropic effects, they call it, that that actually improved outcomes, um, specifically, obviously, secondary uh, outcomes for cardiovascular events and death. But it was then after the Improve It trial came out that showed no, it actually did lower outcomes once they looked further past the, the, the surrogate marker of the CIMT. Right. It actually did improve outcomes, and this is, this drug works in a different way than statins do. Basically decreases the absorption of cholesterol in the intestine, but, uh, and so that's like, okay, well maybe there is something to this LDL hypothesis. I started going to the NLA meetings, Dr. Dayspring, if you know who he is, yep. he was in Richmond right near where I was, um, 
uh, working and reached out to him and he became a mentor of mine, sent me a lot of lipidology books and I was like, this is super fascinating. Got really into the pathophysiology of atherosclerosis. Um, still with a skeptical mindset, but like, you know, thinking this is something that needs to be looked at further because I'd be getting yeah. some of these patients. So that's why I've gotten really fascinated in the whole lipidology world. Like, I'm an NLA member. I'm about to take my lipidology boards. I am pro, uh, I do believe in the LDL hypothesis, but I do understand that atherosclerosis is much more complex than just simply LDL particles becoming yeah. retained in the wall. All right, yeah, so there's a lot there to talk about with yeah. with the uh, cholesterol. So, gosh, where to begin? So going back to the Zedia trial, though, so yeah. the Improve It trial, where adding Zedia to a statin lowered LDL further and did show a reduction in cardiovascular events. Not all cars, not all cause right. mortality, but cardiovascular events. But put into perspective, right, it's one of those trials where they're going to say it was a 20% reduction, right. when in reality it was a less than 1% absolute risk reduction. Right, right, right. Right? So less than 1% of the people saw a benefit in reduction of heart attacks, but it was a benefit. Right. And that's one of the dilemmas we fall into is seeing a benefit, but seeing such a small benefit to say, okay, is it it's statistically significant. Is it clinically significant right. for that one patient you're yep. seeing? And does it then confirm an entire model saying that right. LDL is the most important thing? And these, these concepts don't have simple answers right. to them, yep. obviously. Um, so it's clear that LDL is involved, but like you just said, that there's more to it than just LDL, right? So part of the problem I have is controlling for metabolic health. Right. Like all those studies, every LDL study has been done in a low fat or a high carb or a standard American diet type right. of setting. And they don't generally control for metabolic health. Now, so what is your take on putting LDL into perspective with HDL triglycerides, the ratios, the metabolic health? Do you think it has the same prognostic value with high HDL, low triglycerides, and good metabolic health. Yeah, I do I do think it's an independent uh, risk factor. Risk factor, I will say, because yeah. there's multiple risk factors. And I do think that in order to initiate atherosclerosis, you do need LDL particles. Otherwise, how are they going to get in there? I know there's some other theories on, on that as well. But I, I actually think that metabolic health is very important as well there are other you know independent risk factors so say for instance a smoker with hypertension they're going to have accelerated atherosclerosis with the same amount of ldl particles as someone who, you know who compared to someone who's very metabolically healthy right so that that area under the curve you know will be accelerated for atherosclerosis with those people with multiple other risk factors now you know you can look at somebody with familial hypercholesterolemia and and that's you know when you go into medical school it's like yeah well those people don't have any other issues it's just a genetic cause of you know their LDL receptor is not working or maybe their ApoB is not connecting to the LDL receptor whatever it is they have a high area under the curve of LDL particles but then when you dive in deeper there may be some other issues in in people with FH the scavenger receptors you know, lots of other things that maybe you can't necessarily extrapolate that data to just somebody who has a low carb ketogenic induced. Right. Anyway, so I'm, I actually am, I have a, I'll actually add you to the document. I do want to uh, publish this uh, blog for Dave Feldman because he's asked me to write, if I'm going to argue against uh, someone who, who doesn't believe that the ketogenic induced LDL, if you want to call them lean mass hyper responder, if they're not at, at high risk, what would you do to, to argue against that? And so I've listed out all the different arguments. And I've actually been in some of the Facebook groups because a lot of the ketogenic proponents, they, have a lot of, they do have a lot of good arguments against the LDL hypothesis based on on their hypothesis themselves so i i'll actually add you to that document because i think it would be good you'll you'll appreciate it but um, yeah i appreciate it because it is important i think to recognize that you know a a, a low carb individual who has a rise in their um in their ldl is very different than someone who has a genetic right uh, genetic mutation that's going to cause a problem with with the receptors i i, I think you can't compare right. those twos and, and stay there say they're the same and then um, comparing an LDL on someone who's improving their blood pressure, improving their weight, right. improving their visceral adiposity and their metabolic syndrome, that's going to carry a different weight than somebody who does have those problems, right? right? So, so it puts us in this in this 
realm of yeah. you're absolutely we don't have the data to yeah. say it's safe but we can also say that none of those people are represented in the ldl right. or the stanton trial so where does that leave right, us exactly right so it you could either say well we still have to go back to the data we have and say it's potentially harmful or you say you've made so many improvements and all these other things right. are improving that we're going to continue to monitor it. Yep. So if you were to recommend to somebody that they continue to be monitored with an elevated LDL yep. um, on a low carb diet with all the other health markers improving, what would you say or how would you say they should be monitored moving forward? So actually when this happens to some of my patients, so I, in my article, I go through the multiple mechanisms because I think there's multiple mechanisms that are increasing the LDL, not just say like Dave's hypothesis of the of the energy model, I, I, I believe that's partly correct, but I also believe there are some other things down-regulating uh, LDL receptor activity, I, I believe soluble fiber and some of these other things in, in there, saturated fat versus monounsaturated. So I actually do my best to add in things like Metamucil and, and, and stuff like that, for soluble fiber, change all their saturated fat to monounsaturated. Then we see their baseline off of that. Then we just, I talk about the risk. I, I go, look, we don't have the data. I go, but you've improved all these other risk factors. You're feeling so much better. We talked about the quality of life. Uh, you know, if you're feeling miserable on multiple medicines and, and you have a lot of excess weight versus where now you're on a ketogenic diet, you feel amazing. Uh, you, you've lost this excess weight. Yeah. Who am I to say then, you know, Hey, this isn't good for you. I, I just talk about, hey, we don't have the data. I talk about it. I talk to them like I'd be talking to you, uh, another uh, physician or scientist that's looking into this. Um, and I give them, I lay it out for them. And they have autonomy. Other doctors, I see in these low carb groups, the doctors basically fire their patients because I, I think they don't want to get sued. I'm not really exactly sure, but I, I tell the patients, I document, I go, look, I think there may be an increased risk. But I don't know if you feel better, you have autonomy, you can choose this, you can choose to go on a statin or not a statin or whatever. Yeah. You can you can you can tell me off and just drink butter and not do any of the monounsaturated fat that I recommend. So like, you know, I, I think patient autonomy is important, but I do lay it out for them. Yeah, that's frustrating when I see people say, my doctor yelled at me and he yeah. fired me and he wouldn't work with me because of this. And it's not our role to no. dictate to people what to do. And But I, I, I guess... I think they're I, scared about getting sued, maybe. Yeah. Is that, yeah, or maybe the insurance companies that, you know, we get these letters that like, patient should be on a statin based on this, this, and this, or this drug based on this, this, and this. And insurance companies are telling us how to practice medicine, which I think is interesting. But. Yeah. But it's also interesting. I mean, we talk about this topic a lot mm -hmm. and, and for good reason, because it, it's, it is sort of a paradigm shift, right. but it's interesting to think like the percentage of people who have this dramatic rise in their LDL actually is pretty small, yeah. I would say. I mean, when you look at the studies of people who are overweight and diabetic, it's almost non-existent in those studies. It really is sort of the people who are already lean and, and right. not don't need to lose as much weight and who are already sort of metabolically healthy. Um, so it really is a specific subset, but it's right. a fascinating subset because it brings up into question the whole LDL hypothesis. And, right. you know, there are plenty of so-called black swans for the right. LDL hypothesis, whether it's the Catavans or um, whether it's the people with FH who have greater Literally. lifespan as as they age if they don't get premature cardiovascular disease. I mean, there are, there are so many um, paradoxes for, mm -hmm. for the LDL hypothesis, and it, it just tells you that it's not so cut and dried. Right. And I guess that's my problem, you know, with the whole lipidology world um, is they they do sort of paint it as a little bit too black and white from my standpoint. Um, and, and I can understand why, but do you, do you see that too? Do you think it's a little too black and white? So without, hopefully I don't get in trouble, but yeah. they're, they're, they're heavily involved with pharmaceutical companies. I, I see. Um, and I think it does need to be a little bit more nuanced because it's like, look, you know, why don't we just talk about it as in we don't have the data in these patients with that are on low carb diets that have ex explosive levels of LDL. Why don't we just say that based on our information on patients that seem to be metabolically unhealthy and maybe with FH, well, like let's just talk about it more in the gray zone as opposed to black and white. So I, I agree with you. I think yeah. we need to be a little bit more. Uh, um, 
more open, open-minded. And it's hard to separate the industry influence and the pharmaceutical influence because that's who funds a lot of the, you know, you go to the lipidology meetings yeah. and who has the booths, who paid the money to be exhibitors. It's a lot of the drugs. And so one of the most recent drugs that came out, the Vesepa, the Icosapent. Um, so that's basically the high, high dose omega-3. Um, uh, EPA only. EPA only, right. Huge which, reductions in, yeah. in events. So for people with high triglycerides, um, adding that, adding it to a statin, right? Yeah, and, yeah. and, and even... Adding it to a statin with people with high triglycerides, they showed like a 5% reduction in cardiovascular it, events. It was a lot. And it didn't show, it didn't even follow the ApoB. It didn't, they weren't even sure what it followed. They, they think that maybe there's differences in how the endothelial function, they showed the, these molecular changes and everything like that. But there, there's, there was a very um, big industry um, kind of push when I was at the meeting kind of learning about that. So I, I'm skeptical because I think I think money influences a lot of things. And I just think the stuff needs to be studied a little yeah. bit more before. <laughs> right. And how much do you react to one study as well, right? Like re reproducibility of a study is such an important concept that just gets lost. One, because the studies are expensive to do. So if a, if a company can spend the money, get a positive result and cash in on it, why wouldn't they from a business standpoint? But from a science standpoint, we should be demanding reproducibility of these studies. Yeah. And that's that's something that's yeah. sorely lacking. Just got to get the money. I mean, I know there's a lot of low-carb uh, CEOs out there. You know, I'm sure they they have a lot of money. They could fund some of these. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be nice, wouldn't it? And now, speaking of which, I mean, you've mentioned Dave Feldman's name. It sounds like you're in the process of working with him on trying yeah. to develop a study uh, to help answer the question answer this question so tell us where you are with that I mean, yes yeah, it's fascinating yes yeah, it's, it's a very important question it needs to be answered at least get some sort some more clues into this otherwise you're going to see people yelling at each other on twitter you're going to see the lipidologists and the ldl proponents yelling at with i think ivor and some of these other guys uh and it's all good fun because it's actually good learning if you you really get down into it but um dave and i kind of came together he's got the group of the lean mass hyper responders and it just, I'm, I'm baffled because I didn't think you could even have some of these exponential increases in LDL. I saw it in practice, but not to levels where people would have homozygous uh, familial hypercholesterolemia. And that's where you'd have two knockouts of various parts of the genes having to do with the LDL receptor or ApoB. So LDL C levels of like 400, 400 500, 600. Yeah. And so I'm seeing this in the group, and it's like, no way, there's got to be something else. But then you see their LDLs before they went on a ketogenic diet, and they're like 130s, 140s, right. maybe 150s. And so um, I'm actually writing, a, I'm going to publish a case series on about five of these uh, individuals. I actually brought it because I'm going to UCSD next year, and the reason I'm going to UCSD next year for preventive medicine uh, is to get a master's in public health, get some more biostats, and also to get some more mentorship to make this, put this study into fruition, make it, make it come to life. Uh, basically, I'm, so I'm going to publish this case series, and then because people don't believe it, I've actually talked to multiple doctors out there. I've sent the lipid profiles of some of these patients. They think no way. They have to have thyroid. They have to have uh, uh, type three, whatever. They have all sorts of things they think that's going on. I'm like no. Right. It is ketogenic diet induced. I, we can't find anything. I don't see anything with the SNPs. There's no LDL receptor issues. Their urines are fine. They're, uh, they're, you know, they don't have nephrotic syndrome or something like that. Their thyroid's fine. They don't have a family history of hyperlipidemia. They do not have anybody with coronary disease in their family. They're lean. No other medical problems. Ketogenic diet. You know, 400, 500 LDL uh, uh, milligrams uh, per deciliter. So what we want to do is we want to basically get like 50 of these uh, lean mass hyper responders. And then we'd really want to get a control group of low carbers who don't have this massive increase, similar metabolic profiles, and and then just watch progression. Now, as we talked before, uh, probably never going to have the, the hard outcomes we were looking for, but at least progression in atherosclerosis and i'd like to you know look at the lumen with like a, a, a ct angiography um i don't think a cac score would do it i think too many people you know if they're young you're not going to see that calcification so the cac being the coronary artery calcification score which is yep. the non-contrast ct that shows just the the presence or absence of calcium in the walls of the artery but the ct angiogram 
injects the contrast into the, yeah. into the veins and you actually do see um, the arterial lumen. You see the whole yeah. artery and you'll be able to detect any plaque. So yeah. you're saying that'll be a little more sensitive than just the calcium score. And as I'm learning more into it, because I really want to understand, I do want to work with a cardiologist who understands the imaging a little bit more. As I'm learning, you can actually look at the at, at the plaque uh, quality a little bit more with the CT angiography. So I do think that we would need to do that and say, look, you know, three, five years, we're comparing the groups. Is it similar progression? Yeah. With And what we talk about is like, it's not just like a 20, 30 milligram per deciliter increase that sometimes you see with some of these individuals. We're talking massive increases, 100, 200 milligrams per deciliter. We should see an effect. Um, similar time frame, area under the curb, ApoB, LDL particles that you would see with someone with familial hypercholesterolemia. Yeah, they've had it since youth, but you should see in a similar time frame uh, that progression. So if we don't see a, 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 that massive progression or any progression or any difference, you know, maybe there is something else going on there that's protective. Just a study that came out was talking about scavenger receptors and how we thought that the LDL particles moved passively, uh, you know, depending on, on their size uh, in the endothelium. Uh, just this new study showing that maybe they actually have to go through these scavenger receptors and, and things like that. So you know, so scavenger receptors, called scavenger receptors because they tend to pick up more of the modified and the oxidized LDL, not so much the normal LDL. They're not like the normal LDL receptor, basically. Well, so something in the, it was just, just published, you know, we may want to link to it. Uh, yeah. It's just interesting because we, as, as we thought, it, the, the LDL particles move passively in, in and out of the endothelium, regardless of whether they're oxidized or not. But there are scavenger receptors on the endothelium, and it may... So hypothesizing further, trying to argue for that. So I'm an LDL proponent, but arguing if I were a ketogenic proponent, uh, an LDL, more of an LDL skeptic, maybe there's maybe there's something protective about the ketogenic diet that downregulates this process. I don't know. Yeah. And that's why I just think it's fascinating because I, I just want to look, you know, Dave and I talk about it. it's a win-win situation. I just want to see. Maybe there's this this would be a breakthrough. And if it and if it does show, uh massive progression as as i would predict then you know that's that's the data we at we least need to know need that need to know that absolutely but if it's protective that actually has major public health um implications because then we can say look we have this amazing tool places like verda their stock or whatever is going to skyrocket people are going to uh love uh, you know, a low carb cardiologist, you would be like, look, we have this tool that's actually protective. Don't worry about your LDL particles. Right. Or, you know, if you have these patients who have massive increases, it's like, hey, actually, this is this is dangerous. We have some strong data here to show that. Either way, I, I'm just interested in the data. I think it's it's fascinating. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons that that's one of the things that sort of attracted me to you and wanted to have you come on the show is because you're not one of these people who just dig your heels in yeah. and say this is the right way, this is my way, and I'm going to defend it. You want to know yeah. the truth. You want to help your patients, and I I think that's the 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 world mo more of us need to live in is don't be so ideological, but right. but really search for the data, understand the data, and understand what we don't know and what we need to know and help us get there, yeah. right? And, and we talked a little bit, I guess this segues a little bit into people, who they are in person and who they are on Twitter. And we talked about that a little bit, and it's humorous because, gosh, people can be such jerks on Twitter, yeah. can't they? And it, it sort of makes you lose sight that what we're really doing is trying to help people improve right. their health, right? So why do you think that is, that people just become so just snarky on Twitter? And it's, I mean, so we, you live behind a computer. I mean, you talk about trolls and things like that, and you just say things you would never say to somebody's face. You know, as a, as a physician, do you, you know, you have to have that bedside manner. You would never, well, I won't say never. I know some doctors that tell their patients they're fat and whatever, things that's just like, oh my gosh, I don't know how you became a doctor. But in general, when you're behind a computer, you don't have that personal connection. Like, can you imagine me saying certain things to you right, right here to your face that are just like, oh my gosh, that yeah. some of the people say on Twitter, right. you know, swearing, uh, and almost threatening in certain ways. And I think, I think if we step back, so take for instance, I don't know if you want to call them vegans or whole, whole food plant-based uh, individuals, proponents, and then the people on the other end, who, like the carnivores, like Dr. Dr. Baker, and how a lot of people, everybody's yelling at each other and kind of making fun of each other. And I, I, I don't mind teasing each other in, in good fun, but um, I, think, I think when you step back and you go to someone like Disneyland and, and Walmart and you see a, there's a lot of people 
they're never going to follow a whole food plant base or a carnivore. I've ha- I've tried to prescribe a carnivore diet as much as I like. I personally, I don't think it's probably optimal, but I've actually prescribed it to patients who I thought it would fit, and they they just wouldn't stick to it, which is interesting. So if you take a step back, most people are just eating just absolute horribly. If we can even get them closer aligned to any type of these types of diets, ketogenic, low carb, high fat, whatever you want to call it whether or a vegan-esque type of diet, I think we're going to have improvement. Most people just have no awareness. And so I think if we all kind of step back, we're all trying to help people. Right. I think I think it would be better. And, and I do think more people need to come across the party lines or whatever, go to each other's conferences, understand where you're coming from. Uh, and I do think, you know, there's industry involvement that's kind of pushed us maybe one way or the other. Mm-hmm. And I, I, there is influence there, and, and I would be naive to say, no, it has nothing to do with it. I, I think we do need to be skeptical about a lot of things. Yeah. And I think we, uh, and I think we all should just come, come together and realize we just try to help people. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, we can, so often we lose track of what we agree on because we're focusing so much on what we disagree on. And while that's important because the details matter, yeah. it's so important to realize that, that our goal is just to help people live better healthier, happier lives. Right, right. And there's exactly. more than one way to do that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so give us an idea of what, what's a day in the life of Dr. Spencer? What, what do you eat? What, how do you exercise? How do you yeah. live your day? What are some of the main things you do during your day to improve your health? Yeah. I, I'm very relaxed now because of my job. I will be going back to training next, uh, in a few months actually, but wake up, get my coffee, black coffee. I don't add anything to the coffee. Um, I do, I don't have much of an appetite in the morning, so I drink a, basically an egg white protein shake and I have a little bit of fruit with that. Um, brush my teeth, exercise, lifting weights, whether I run, bike, lift weights, or now I'm getting into jujitsu cause it's not as hard on the body as wrestling was. Um, and, and, uh, lots of vegetables, lean protein, a little bit of healthy starch, healthy fat thrown in there. That's kind of the way I do it. Yeah. Um, uh, eight hours of sleep, very standard, kind of boring stuff, but like the stuff that we kind of know is good for you. Yeah. Very, very simple. Very simple. It's good. And, and obviously it's working for you, right? Yeah. You got, yeah. Your metabolic health is probably yep. dialed in as good as it can be right now. Yep. So yeah, I've, I've, since medical school, I've got my NMR a few times a, a, a year, basically watched LDL particles change and insulin's always very low. Yeah. Uh, A1C, actually it's interesting, my A1C on a lower carb diet, I've gone ketogenic, it actually kind of starts going up a little bit, interestingly, may have something to do with the red blood cell life. Anyway, we don't have to get into that, but most, yeah, very metabolically healthy when, when looking at that. There's yeah. some variance depending on what kind of diet I'm doing at the time. And it sounds like a lot of exciting things on your horizon, starting uh, with the Preventive Medicine uh, is it pre- pre- Preventive Medicine Fellowship? Is it's, that what it is? For, for me, it's technically a fellowship because okay. I'm already board certified, yeah. but uh, it, it's a residency for okay. people who you know don't aren't already board Got certified. It. So and I get a, plus a Master's of yeah, Public Health Master's in that. Master's of Public Health. And then working on a lot of projects along this arena. So I look forward to seeing more from you coming down the pipe. So yeah, thanks, thank you. Thanks thank for you. taking the time for joining Th- us. Thanks it's for having pleasure. me on. All right.